Let's call the meeting to order. Mayor Sikowski? Here. Alderman Kittle? Here. Alderman Vries? Here. Alderman Weinmeyer? Here. Alderman Montello? Here. Alderman Volkert? Here. Alderperson Kraft? Here. Pledge of Allegiance. I, of the United States of America, the Republic for which it stands, God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Your motion to adopt the agenda as proposed. Make a motion we adopt the agenda. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, so moved. Um, any public comments? State your name again. Name is Chris Milliron. I want to know how much money the city of New Richmond is willing to spend. Address too. I'm on County Road Double G in New Richmond. On how much money they're going to spend on going after fire department people. Razor right now, from what I've been able to track down, is three hundred and thirty-six thousand dollars. Hate to say it, but that's asinine to spend that kind of money over these types of things. Chief Yellick, I respect the man. On January 7th of this year, I was on traveling down 11th Street or County Road Double G, Powers Crossroad, and one of your firefighters in the Red Durango, who it was, I have no idea. I was coming up to the stop sign, he was coming down 140th, flying like a bat out of, out of heck. He never slowed down. There was a car sitting at the intersection. The snow piles were so high. He flew through that stop sign, stop sign without even slowing down. He dissed about T-bone that poor person in that vehicle in front of me. I was coming up so I could see him come, whoever it was coming. That cannot be allowed. I understand that, but what does this have to do with the... Uh has to do with the lawsuits. It has to do with all of it. I mean, you're allowing certain firefighters to do certain things in this town and not holding everybody accountable. If you're going to hold one person accountable, hold all accountable. I don't, some of the stuff that's going on is foolishness. You're going after some firefighters, you're not going after all. I've Gone through open book records, asking about a certain firefighter that works for the city. For some reason, and I don't know how it can be, everything is pay coded the same way, whether he's working for the electric department or if he's responding to fires. That can't be. He's, state statute says when you go report to fires, you're off the city clock. And then you're on the firefighter budget. But that's the same thing you went after Jim Vanderwerst for, was supposed to be th these types of things. You held Jim accountable. You're not holding this gentleman accountable. This stuff has got to end. Everybody is getting tired of what's going on. I mean, I'm out there to put the word out to everybody Hold everybody equally accountable. Don't pick and choose your battles. Hold everybody to the same standard. I worked for government for 30 years. I know pay codes should not be the same. I did, I did payroll for 56 officers. You cannot have pay codes the same for everything. You don't know when people are on vacation. You don't know when people are... Out on workman's comp, you don't know when they're actual working. If everything's pay coded the same, you can't have that. Everybody needs to be held accountable. Chief Yellick holds his officers accountable. I know he does. I respect the man. I know what he goes through. I've talked to him. Not about these matters, but as a person, I know he does. I go to the annual fire commission meeting. 
the fire chief isn't there. Why not? It's his department. He shouldn't he be there to ask, answer questions? There was nobody. None of his officers were there. They should be. Somebody needs to be there. So they can ask, the fire commission can ask questions and get answers. People need to be held accountable. I think you made your point now. Uh, is there anything else? Are you going to hold them accountable as a city? I think we do hold people accountable. I don't think you do. Well, that's, this is uh, public comment. You made your public comment. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, we're not going to argue here. So, I mean, thanks, thanks for your comments, but we're going to move on then. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Uh, continuing business, employee handbook updates. Sarah? Good evening, Mayor and Council. In the packet this evening is the draft employee handbook that was presented at the January work session as a first reading. This most recent draft incorporates updates and revisions to 35 existing policies within the handbook. Each individual policy um, is identified in the memo as well as a red line copy was included in the packet. The revisions and updates were reviewed by our legal counsel that specializes in labor and employment matters. Staff had requested at the last work session for council to review the revisions and reach out if there were any questions or clarification that was needed. Staff has heard from majority of council um, who supported the updates and revisions. Um, as such, tonight we're seeking formal motion approving the updates to the employee handbook as provided in the packet. And then in addition, staff will be reaching out um, and meeting with council in March um, to obtain feedback on the last of the policies that we intend to bring forward, as well as eliciting feedback from staff as appropriate. Mr. Mayor, just to frame the conversation, I'm going to make a motion that we approve the uh, updates as they have been presented. I'll second that. Uh, any further discussion? Not. You want to take the roll, please? Alderman Kittle? Yes. Alderman Vries? Yes. Alderman Weinmeyer? Yes. Alderman Montello? Yes. Alderman Volker? Yes. Alderperson Kraft? Yes. Uh, motion passes. New business, board and commission appointments. Monica? Thank you. Um, as you are aware, when we passed a resolution to become a third class city by state statute, that means the library board has to have nine members instead of seven. Um, so we did pass updates to the bylaws and put out a posting. Um, very surprised we received actually five applicants, four of whom were eligible. And so went through interviews, talked to a lot of people, and I would recommend um, Caitlin Stack and Lisa Nazer to be appointed to the library board. Your motion to approve. A motion to approve the. And I will second that motion. Any uh, discussion for Monica or questions? I see that they're going to be different ones a three year term, ones a one year term. Which is which? It honestly doesn't matter. The reason I wanted uh, one as a one year and one as a three year is to keep them on the even three year cycle. All library board are up every three years, although there's no limit of terms. Um, so that would get them um, so that we had three expiring every year. I understand the process. I'm just wondering which of these candidates is getting the one year and which is getting the three. Don't you know yet? I don't know yet. Okay. <clears throat> Want to take the roll, please? Alderman Vries? Yes. Alderman Weinmeyer? Yes. Alderman Montello? Yes. Alderman Volkert? Alderperson Kraft, Alderman Kittle. Yes. Motion passes. Uh, final plat application, Fox Run, fourth edition. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thone Property Investments LLC has submitted a final plat application for 23 single family dwellings in Fox Run, fourth edition. Their preliminary plat was approved in February 2022 and showed a total of 52 dwellings. Final plat applications are subject to the review and recommendation of the Development Review Committee and the final approval of City Council. 
Only minor changes have been made since the preliminary plat, and we have been working with ACA and Ben and Tim Thone to ensure the final plat is up to our city standards and specifications. Pending the resolution of 10 conditions in the memo, the DRC recommends approval of this application. Chairman, offer a motion that we approve uh, this final um, Yeah, the fourth edition, the Fox Run fourth edition, the final final uh, final plat application. There it is, mm -hmm. with the ten conditions outlined in the memo. Any uh, further discussion or questions? Not uh, take the roll, please. Alderman Weinmeyer. Yes. Alderman Montello. Yes. Alderman Volkert. Yes. Alder Person Craft. Yes. Alderman Kittle. Yes. Alderman Vries. Yes. Uh, motion passes. Rezoning of city-owned properties within the business and technical park. City staff is initiating a rezone of four city-owned parcels within the business and technical park on Madison Avenue, across from Spine Pro, Accelerated Plastics, 45th Parallel, and Lift Bridge. This application is subject to the review and recommendation of a public hearing at Plan Commission. These changes are proposed to become consistent with the recent changes of the future land use map. The southern three lots are currently zoned Z7 industrial, and we are proposing to rezone to Z3 mixed-use corridor, which allows for a mix of commercial, lodging, and or residential. The northern lot we are proposing to change from two zoning designations, Z1 agricultural and Z7 industrial, to completely Z1 agricultural, as it is an undevelopable parcel and is home to a trail and stormwater pond. The Planning Commission reviewed these proposed changes at their meeting on February 7th and recommend approval of Ordinance 591. There a motion to approve uh, the Business and Technical Park amendments, zoning amendments. Uh, I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Ordinance 591. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion or questions? Please take the roll, please. Alderman Montello? Yes. Alderman Volker? Yes. Alderperson Kraft? Yes. Alderman Kittle? Yes. Alderman Breeze? Yes. Alderman Weinmeyer? Yes. Motion passes. Alcohol <laughs> Operators License Guidelines. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this was actually brought forward at my request. There's been over the years since I took over as chief a number of different um, license to serve issues that have come up um, where I just didn't feel like we had really set guidelines on what I was supposed to be approving and what I wasn't. Um, so we worked with City Attorney Vivian and came up with a list of guidelines that was vetted by the Public Safety Committee. Um, those have been uh, tweaked and are here before you tonight. But it just offers not only myself, but offers the council um, some guidelines for um, approving or more importantly probably disapproving uh, folks that come in looking for a license to serve. Um, I don't know that this is super limiting. Um, it still doesn't keep people from working in the field. They just need to be working under a licensed bartender at the time. So um, I'd entertain any questions from if the council should have any, but I think this just helps clarify not only for me but for you all as well if somebody were to come in and file um, a review from the council, since you are the ultimate body and who approves or disapproves. Um, it the just kind of spells it out for us. Question I have for you, Chief. So really right now we have no operating guidelines. I mean, they're very, um, well, I don't know. Do, do we have a written policy as such prior to this? We do not. So and it was just basic, basing it off a of state statute, which this also does, but I think it just, um, memorializes what we're looking for and and that it also shows what the criteria is for suspected applicants that come in they know right away whether they're going to qualify or not the other really important part of this is that um, there's a lot of people that fill out the application and neglect to put certain things down um, which causes a lot of headaches if we were to miss something or anything along those lines and it just offers some penalties, if you will, if they should choose to not self-disclose some of the things that they've had in their past. A lot of those things aren't going to disqualify them from the license, 
itself, but uh, you know, just making sure that they're disclosing and being forthcoming with information, especially about any um, drug and alcohol history, which is closely related to the license. So, I'm uh, sorry, Nick was going to make ahead. a comment. Yeah, I, I was just going to add to that. So, the statute itself itself gives you the authority to deny based on charges and past history that are substantial the service of alcohol. But the statute itself doesn't say what's substantial. And a lot of the policy that has come uh, with respect to this statute has been a result of case law. So communities like New Richmond are adopting policies like this uh, to really address and uh, help provide guidance as to what it means to be substantial. So that applicants are aware, so that the council is aware, so it makes it easier for the processing. Because right right now, without that policy in place, without these guidelines, it's, it's pretty difficult to determine whether something is or is not substantially related. So that's the intent of this policy, is really to help clarify for applicants, for the council, for the police department, what is and what is not substantially related, and what, in fact, you can take into account when making a determination as to whether you should consider approving or denying um, a request of this kind. That end, um, as I look through these, do these all have to do, these particular uh, situations that are outlined here, are they all have to do with alcohol or drug related offenses? For the most part, um, some of them are felony type offenses. Sure. Um, but most of them are, especially the shorter term stuff is specifically related to alcohol and drug offenses. And just thinking back uh, uh, not too many years, um, if, if somebody is, um, you know, you have to check the box. When somebody <coughs> comes and apply and you do your background check and we got to check the box, oh, they, they, they did that, okay? Um, and I, I'm reading the language here and it says they don't qualify for an operator's license, right? Under just to give, just go with me on that case. So is that applicant coming to the city council or not? That's up to them. They could file an appeal with the city council if they want to. And that's part of what this does is it gives you guidelines so we're um, consistent and fair in the way that we apply the rules to everyone. Asking the question, does every single application, despite potentially having some of these offenses, are they still coming to the council for approval or denial or is that an independent decision that you're going to make and not bring forward? No, the way, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, asking. Nick, but the way, the way that I understand it is if I tell them that I'm not going to approve or make a recommendation to the council that it's approved, it's up to them to file that appeal with the council. Yeah, and what, what typically happens, and this has happened a few times over the last several years, uh, Craig will receive an application that has an issue with it or something that that causes questions and in the past he said well i guess i have to pass this on to the council and allow the council to make the determination and sometimes the council has approved it and sometimes it has um, this set of guidelines and policies will allow craig to say to an applicant because you have x y or z <laughs> let's just say a um you've provided false information or uh you have uh felony on your record or, or whatnot, he can say to the applicant, you don't qualify. And the applicant can say, well, I may not qualify, but I want the city council uh, to hear my, my application. So the applicant will still be in control and will still have the opportunity to be heard before the council. However, they will know clearly up front that based on our policy that they don't qualify, and then they'll have the opportunity <coughs> to make some extraordinary case as to why the council should, in fact, approve their application despite the fact that they don't qualify. Is it fair to say, and I guess we could wait until this happens, is it fair to say that um, by codifying this, um, we're really establishing, uh, for lack of a better word, precedent that says that if, if the council was going to override this policy, like we have, and I'll say we, like the council did a few years ago, when I read through this, I think an individual who had applied was guilty of something in here 
Um, we really don't have a basis to approve those. And I, and I just really want to make sure I understand this because it says if a person does X, Y, Z, they don't qualify for an operator's license if they appeal. And just so the, so the council understands, we're saying these are the rules. This is the way it's going to be. It's not a matter of, well, da, 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 da. It's, that's what it is. So I don't, well, she, it's yeah, creating. Yes no. I, think, I think there's still an opportunity for them to come in front. And I know the council, um, the previous council and this council have, have both said that we believe in second chances. And I'm not taking away the ability for you to give second chances. But there are some specific state statutes that we, as a council, can't violate either, um, or as a city. And, and I think it spells those particular cases out. Like, you know, if somebody's feloniously maintaining a drug house, which is substantially related to the sale of alcohol, that, that's my understanding of the statute. I'm not an attorney, but that's kind of a hard no. Um, okay. There are some things. There was a, a person that came in front of the council a while back that, that had some of the things on here that weren't felony level cases, but they were still items that caused me concern. And she came in and talked to the council about, you know, her um, background that she had, the things that she has done since those incidences to improve, and the council was able to approve her. You know, I'm not trying to say that we're, we're just hard-lined here and we're not giving people second chances or trying to take somebody's livelihood away from them, but I think it just helps us be strategic and consistent, at least for me, on what I'm approving and what I'm not. It's still ultimately going to be the council's decision if they put themselves in front of you. Um, but again, like Nick said, it's, it's up to them to do that. But I and think, I'll, and I'll give you a good example, a relevant uh, example. And one of the other communities that I represent, months we had an operator's license applicant uh, who had a DUI on the record. So the statute doesn't say whether a We now say in our policy that uh, operating a motor vehicle while under the influence of intoxicants or drugs within the last three years. So we are providing more specificity. Now, certainly a, a person could appeal to you, come before the council, and explain the circumstances and any mitigating efforts, classes that they've gone through, experiences that they've had to and you will have the opportunity to make findings. Uh, and if you see fit, you can overrule your policy. But you would be overruling your policy based upon the specific findings, based on that person appearing before the council, as opposed to simply saying, well, we don't think an operating under the influence is related to, we think it is related to, or we don't think it's, it's related to, substantially related to the service. So we're trying to take some of the, the mystery out of it. We're trying to take some of the ambiguity out of it. Uh, I think the chief has, has done a nice job in identifying those circumstances where we just want to be very clear to provide the council with, with the guidelines. And then ultimately, if somebody decides that they want to have that conversation with the council, they can, they can do that. We did that in this other community. Uh, the, the board uh, was um, thankful that the person appeared. They explained their circumstances. The application request. Um, so you have that latitude, but this is really just setting the, the ground rules so that there's some clarity with respect to what does qualify and what doesn't qualify. It's a, I, I think it's a great um, outline of, you know, what are the standards, what are the criteria. It gives you objective criteria in order to make your decision. So it should make things easier for you, Craig. Hopefully that's the goal. And then, I mean, pretty easy to determine whether or not you know, somebody meets the guy. I mean, I don't know. I, I love the framework of it. I think it holds the council accountable to following those same guidelines, too. That it, it doesn't matter if you're a friend, a family, you know, someone we've done business with. The fact remains that if you are in, um, I mean, if you, if you don't meet the criteria, you don't meet the criteria. So we have to have an objective justification for going outside of this policy. So I think it's a great accountability standard for this council as well. Completely agree, Nick. Bye. Just for the record, the policy says you gotta have two of those. 
uh, within the last uh, three years. So I, I just it's kind of interesting there. But Mr. Mayor, I'm going to offer a motion that we approve alcohol operator license guidelines as. I will second that. One question. Um, <clears throat> any questions? Um, in the past, were we, were we actually going against state law? Let, let, let me answer that question more succinctly. No, we did not violate state law yeah. or act contrary to state law. State law provides you with the council with the discretion to make the decisions on operating licenses and to determine whether the, the prior act or acts were substantially related to the sale of alcohol. So the, the council in the past, despite the chief's um, decision not to recommend approval, the council in the past has approved those operators despite the position that the police department has, has taken. So it, it utilized its discretion, but it didn't follow your own police department's recommendation. This is, a, this is an enrichment policy that can be tweaked and changed throughout the years, correct? correct. Consistent with state law. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I'm so I'm I'm really glad that there is something in there that that gives somebody the right to say here's why this happened here's how I've corrected myself because I do believe in second chances there's not everybody that's perfect um, people have made mistakes in the past I like the fact that it says three years I, I like the fact that it says a lot of things that we have never had before which is good I think it will prevent people from kind of going to the council no matter what when the chief can say here's Here's the criteria. Here's what they're thinking. Here's what they've said. That if you've had one in the last three years, they're going to say no. And you can say that. But it still gives them a, a, a chance to come to us and say and explain situations and talk about it. And sometimes that's healthy for, for people that are trying to get through some things in their life. So, Any other questions? Not take the roll, please. Alderman Volkert? Yes. Alderperson Kraft? Yes. Alderman Kittle? Yes. Alderman Breeze? Yes. Alderman Weinmeyer? Yes. Alderman Montello? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, well, number four, emergency backup generator bids. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, currently, our well number four is the only well that we have that does not have emergency backup power. Um, so if we had any sort of power outage where it was prolonged, <coughs> um, we would have no means to operate that well. Um, so it was a, identified in the CIP to um, get a backup generator for that well. The budget for the CIP was about $65,000. Um, we put that out for bids. We received five bids back. Um, the low bid, um, you can disregard because they didn't fulfill um, what we were looking for. That's uh, essentially just to supply a generator. It didn't include any install costs. There's also some work that has to be done with the well electric panel um, to get the, the generator to operate. Um, so then the, the next lowest bid was Simon Electric with the Generac generator for $47,950. Um, staff had a little bit of concern with the Generac that it might not last the 30 plus years that we're looking to get out of a generator. Um, however, after some discussion, it was decided at the Utility Commission that we would go forward with the, the low bid and, and recommend that. So we use this one? I mean, the one that's there now? There's not, we don't have one now. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. What, yep. what about the generator that is operating? There is we, no, there nothing is at no, all in. Nope, so if, okay. we, if we had a power outage, we have three other wells that would run, but this, this, just one, kicks this one could not run. Okay. Until we get a generator, yep. I'd make a, <clears throat> make a motion to approve the uh, Generac generator through Simon Electric for the purchase price of $47,950. Second. I'm sorry, and to include the five-year warranty. And we have a second. Um, any further discussion? If not, please take the roll. Alderperson Kraft? Yes. 
Alderman Kittle? Yes. Alderman Vries? Yes. Alderman Weinmeyer? Yes. Alderman Montello? Yes. Alderman Volker? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, sewer televising equipment bids. Yeah, so the city spends about $30,000, $35,000 every year on televising of the sewer collection system. It was identified last year that we may want to look into doing purchasing our own televising equipment um, and relatively pay it off, it pay itself off in within a few years um, by doing all the televising in-house. Um, so Dave Poof on the water department um, put some specs out for bids. They um, tested out some of this equipment. Um, we got three bids back ranging from just over $94,000 up to almost $130,000. Uh, the low bid is actually the equipment that they tested that they actually preferred. Um, so that worked out pretty well. Um, so it would be our recommendation to move forward with the low bid from McQueen for $94,456. Um, uh, just to preface that, that is just the televising equipment. We still have to have somewhere to house it and somewhere to transport it. And so they've looked into some options of some of the, these uh, equipment dealers can supply a trailer that's already fitted, it's ready to go. Um, you just plug the equipment into it and it's good to go. That was, the cost for that was about twenty to $30,000. Dave looked into buying a trailer ourselves and outfitting it ourselves. It would it'd take some man hours, um, but they were looking at about $15,000 there. Um, and then the third option they looked into is um, once the ambulance service is done with their existing ambulance and, and looking at buying a new one, we could potentially buy their old one from them and house the equipment in that. And that actually would be the preferred option. That's pretty ideal for, for housing the equipment. It's safer than a trailer. Um, it would just be much more convenient and actually be cheaper than the other options. But your recommendation doesn't, that isn't part of the recommendation. No, I just wanted to go over those, just, just so you know, because we had $150,000 in the CIP, we're at about 94 and some change. There's gonna be some more costs before we can have this up and running. I think that that idea, Mike, will come back to the uh, utility commission for trailer or housing the the equipment. Well, I'd, I'd make a motion to approve the uh, the equipment from Rover X System for ninety four thousand four hundred fifty six dollars. I'll second that, and I just want to add: I'm telling you, you're missing a marketing opportunity here. <laughs> there are people with local access especially if we could get somebody to do some, uh, you know, that kind of documentary voice uh, talking about here's the sewer pipe in front of your house. I, we have somebody in the room that would probably love to hear her sewer pipe described. So... Um, I thought you were offering to narrate our uh, yeah, televising. I, 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 I thought she would be we happy to, too. but I'm not sure the city would sign off on what I would say. <laughs> uh, but I am also concerned that if somebody pulls up in front of somebody's house with an ambulance and go into the manhole, <laughs> I'm not sure what message that sends, but get prepared. And this we'll, can we'll be all some different colors. This can be all done. <laughs> this can be all done in house. Yep. Yep. So then, yeah, we'd we'd start doing everything in house. Um, we'd not only cover the televising that we do every year, but then we'd have it on hand for emergency purposes. If we ever had uh, an issue, a line collapse, that sort of thing, we have our own televising equipment so we can go in and check it out. And do you spend 30000 every year? I mean, no matter what, that's budgeted and that's what it that has gets been spent the, every year. That's what it has been in the past. Okay. But payback's about three years in. Right. Yeah. And is there a guarantee on the equipment? There was a two-year warranty. Any uh, further questions? Otherwise, take the roll, please. Alderman Kittle? Yes. Alderman Vries? Yes. Alderman Weinmeyer? Yes. Alderman Montello? Yes. Alderman Volker? Yes. Alderperson Kraft? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, requ request for authorization to solicit bids, Casey Lift Station Upgrades. Yep, so the Casey lift station is one of our higher use lift stations. Uh, the pumps in the station are getting a little worn down. Um, one of them they have issues with quite a bit. There's something going on with it. They can't quite figure out what. Um, usually you can tell by the run times of the pumps. And they, there's two pumps in the station and they alternate. And usually the pumps should run about the same amount of hours. 
And when you start seeing one pump running a lot more hours than the other one, you know something's going wrong with it. And they're starting to see that. Um, so it's come to a point where we should replace these pumps. We're actually looking at possibly upgrading them because of future development in the area. Um, so at this time, we would uh, recommend to move forward. And we're just looking right now for authorization to go out for bids. Your motion to authorize bids. I'll make that motion. Second. Any uh, further discussion? Not take the roll, please. Alderman Vries? Yes. Alderman Weinmeyer? Yes. Alderman Montello? Yes. Alderman Volker? Yes. Alderperson Kraft? Yes. Alderman Kittle? Yes. Uh, motion passes. West Central Biosolids Facility Project Upgrades and Sewer Rate Study Update. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, so this evening, we really just wanted to provide you an update related to the West Central Biosolids um, projects that they have. It has been outlined in our CIP um, the last couple of discussions in regards to some facility upgrades. So we just want to give you an update in regards to that um, and walk you through what that, if those projects continue to move forward, um, some options and what the impact would be potentially on our rates as well. So just starting with a little bit of background, um, the city of New Richmond in conjunction with 10 other municipalities in 1995 uh, formulated and entered into the intergovernmental agreement for the handling, storage, treatment, and disposal of biosolids. Um, currently to date, there are an additional 10 non-members that also utilize the facility to process their biosolid waste. Um, on average, New Richmond Utilities has about seven loads per week. Um, that go down to Ellsworth and are processed there. Ray, and before you go any further, um, I, and I don't know, this is I, whoever, just a really kind of just a quick word about, I, I guess you're talking about Ellsworth Biosolids facility, but is part of your presentation really talking about what happens down there? Um, maybe at a little bit of a higher level, not really getting into the details of what's in there. I know, I think, Mike, you've toured. I did. The facility, and I, correct. The only reason I bring it up is because, um, and I'm probably one of those people that really before I was down there, I thought what happens out at our wastewater treatment plant's the end. Not the end. I don't even know. But there's a lot of processing that happens. And I just think for, for the average person listening, um, to, to really kind of understand what it is we're talking about. So I don't want to steal your thunder. I was just curious if at and least when you start talking about that, if there could be some conversation. Now, Eric obviously knows his fill in the blank, um, so he can talk about it. But <laughs> anyhow. But essentially in, in short of that, and maybe yeah. I'll just insert it here, sure. um, that the kind of the, what would you call it, our byproduct, yeah, so we clean the wastewater, we clean the water piece as well as we can, close to drinkable. Some people probably would. Um, but a byproduct of that process is there's solids or a sludge that's developed. And so then we store that for a certain period of time, but then eventually you have to deal with it and get rid of it. And so that was the, back in the day, you used to be able to land spread it and you that got harder and harder to do. There weren't any areas to land spread. So then that's when this consortium started to deal with the sludge that's the byproduct from these treatment plants. I, I think one thing that was helpful to me when we were down there and toured it, um, they talked about, and I don't know if you know this, Eric, but the percentage of moisture that's in what we ship down there, and then th there's a product that comes back here, right? Yeah, there's uh, some of the waste, the water that they press off of the sludge. So they, what they do is we, we send it down there. It's, it's like a jelly form almost. Um, and then they dry it further. And some of that water moisture that comes off that sludge. Comes back here. Comes back here. And we treat it again. Thank you. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Rand. I just nope, thought it was helpful for people. And I, and I really appreciated the comment because actually when I was much younger, um, I remember sewer plants, wastewater treatment plants, spreading this stuff on fields and process much further than it used to have to be. Sorry, Rand. Um, do we want to, are we good on how 
<laughs> and then eventually good. it gets dried we down there good. and then we want to talk about the consistency of, of well. the sludge so, any, any okay. longer. <laughs> so if we go to the next slide, Michelle. Um, so over the last couple of years at the biosolids facility with the aging equipment and infrastructure that has been in place since 1995, um, there is a need to address those aging pieces of equipment as well as the capacity at the facility. Um, so there initially was a three-phased approach that the biosolids was looking at. It was considered or referred to as phase 0 0.05, phase one and phase two. Originally, phase 0 0.5 was about a $3 million project cost. Um, over the, the last few discussions, the projects have been consolidated into a more of a two-phased approach. So that phase one kind of was split between both the half phase and then the phase two. And so underneath the phase half currently, um, that project scope would look at addressing um, holding capacity of the biosolid. So it would increase capacity holding by one day. Currently there is a one day um, capacity. So it would be increasing that to two days of capacity. It would also be increasing uh, the footprint of the building itself, um, addressing some age back issues, and then addressing some of the aging equipment and processing equipment as well. The estimate of that phase was uh, about $7 million at the latest estimate. That portion um, of that phase did go out to bid recently in January. The bid opening was held last week. Um, we did attend that virtually. The bids did come back higher than anticipated. So the low bid uh, with alternatives was 9.5 million with the high bid being 11 million. Um, and so with that, um, obviously a little bit significantly higher than what was anticipated. If we wanna go to the next slide, Michelle. Um, on phase two, this project has an estimated cost of about $20 million. Um, it is not, has not been bid out yet, but given the cost estimates of where the phase 0 0.5 came in, we would anticipate that that estimated cost of $20 million is probably higher um, than what the estimate currently is. So with that, what does that potentially look like on both of the phases? Um, so in anticipation of that, we reached out to Trilogy Consulting um, who conducted our 2018 water and sewer study update. We provided them the information on the estimate, so the earlier estimates of the half uh, phase at $7 million and then the phase two at $20 million, and asked them to, taking into account our CIP as well, uh, what would that impact look like on our rate payers? And so in the initial study in 2018, um, just to cover our own operating expenses and allow for a rate of return to address future capital infrastructure replacements, it was anticipated a 3% increase would be needed annually um, from the sewer utility. And so that's kind of been the trajectory and the path that we have been on since 2019 with that first um, sewer rate adjustment. With the revised mini kind of study update that we did uh, late last year, that amount has increased to 4%, really given some of the inflationary pressures, they are now recommending um, that we need to move from 3% to 4% with no other impact of the biosolid being taken into account. Can you go to the next slide? Um, when we look at just the impact of the phase 0 0.5, again at the $7 million range, um, we asked Trilogy to evaluate that and based upon that, that would impact rates and increase those by 10%. Um, based upon the time frame, initially we would anticipate that that would have to go in place in 2024. Um, and if phase two continues to um, progress forward, that would then uh, result in an additional increase of 12%, um, which could be anticipated in 2026. Um, again, those estimates were based upon, or those rates were based upon the estimate. We would anticipate now with the actual cost coming in on the half phase that there would be a, a, a little bit more of a percentage rate increase on that first phase of the project. 
Uh, if we go to the next slide, these are a little bit harder to read, but it was in the packet um, and is in the report of Trilogy. We just went through um, what the impact would be on a residential user, on a commercial and industrial user from a low, high, and um, medium usage perspective. The, in the table, the communities that are asterisks are the communities that are also members in the biosolids um, facility as well. So that's important to note from the aspect that these rates are rates in today. Um, the communities that are also part of the biosolids facility, we would anticipate that their rates would be adjusted as well um, due to these projects. So just to give you a little bit of a, a comparative, even though we might, uh, with our rates, if these projects continue to move forward, uh, we would have rate increases. We would anticipate a shift in the entire table. Um, but for example, in the phase 0 0.5, the impact on a residential user would be about a $50 increase um, in sewer costs per year. And moving to phase two would result in about $118 of an increase annually. Slide. The next slide is um, looking at commercial and industrial users. I'm not gonna really go through every um, component in there. And then we can go to slide eight. Um, so really from this point and kind of the next steps and what we discussed with the Utility Commission last week, um, this week on Thursday, the biosolid members will be holding their annual meeting. Uh, we did anticipate that there would be potential action on the bid results for that first phase, that phase 0 0.5 um, from the results last week. However, in discussion with the Utility Commission, we did feel from a staff perspective um, that before awarding the bid for that phase, uh, that the engineering group continue to finalize and work and find ways to potentially um, value engineer uh, the bid as well as provide updated debt service schedules to member communities so that we can do a farther evaluation on the potential impact on rates that it would have for our communities. Um, previously, the phase 0 0.5 did have support of the members, but given, again, the cost, um, the actual bids coming back in higher than anticipated, we would think that it would be placed um, for us to request with the other members to continue to evaluate the bid, um, run those debt service schedules, and then bring back um, those results for a later action from the member groups. Um, and then lastly, too, we also discussed with the Utility Commission more of a long-term um, potential options. And before we go into potentially phase two, exploring um, some other options and seeing what um, may be in the best interest of the city of New Richmond, uh, which could include looking at in-house processing, um, which would require a facility of our own to process those biosolids, um, looking at other external uh, resources or avenues in order to uh, dispose of our uh, byproduct. Um, obviously, the other option is to continue to remain um, as a member within the West Central Biosolids group. Um, we do anticipate with the phase two, if that would continue to move forward as an option, um, that the, the group, the members would be asked to extend their commitments with the Biosolids group. So currently we are in year three of a 20 year um, commitment. So in order for phase two to move forward and to secure financing, they would be looking at um, extending that another full 20 years um, in order to obtain the financing necessary. So tonight we are not really seeking any specific action. We just again wanted to provide the council with an update in regards to uh, where these projects are at, um, relay the information that we discussed with the utility commission and the feedback that we retain there. And if there's any questions or additional feedback that the council would like us to bring forward to the meeting with the biosolids group this week. Um, we'd like to hear that feedback at this time. I heard that one of the uh, original members is probably gonna pull out and do their own uh, treatment plant now. And I know when we bought the, we'll work with the doors, get the door prairie. The reason we got, the reason we got that property is to expand on the sewage treatment plant. 
so we'd have more, uh, we'd have the land. And at that time, uh, so we put all the infrastructure, the trails and everything in there as a trade-off because we got the land for free, I believe, but we had to do the, the trail and other stuff in there. But the main reason was to get the land so we'd have room for further expansion. So before, I see before we're gonna go any further down the line that we're gonna look at other possibilities, which is good, I, good that I see in here. Because this could be a really expensive project for New Richmond too. I, I don't think it could be a really expensive project. This will be it is, a, yeah. an expensive project. Even doing the 0.5 is gonna drastically increase our sewer rates. Or we plan to do our expenses are going to go up tremendously. And on this report from Trilogy, and I on the in the attachment, it has the communities broken down. Residential communities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Curious. Um, Actually, a couple questions for you, but the city of Richmond's listed four times there. I'm not sure why the different rates and what those scenarios. Yep, so what we wanted to illustrate was the various impact of the project, the impact of no project, the phase 0 0.5, the phase two, um, and then just the annualized increase of 4% to year, um, 2026 as well. So it's moving through, it shows New Richmond in four different ways, moving through those various phases of example. So no change, which isn't. Right. So that's, that's where it says current and then the 4% Level two or. So Yep, so actually um, the 4% increase is just what we would need to do annually without any of the phased projects in it. The 14% would be the 10% related to the half phase plus the annual 4% increase. Um, and then the 33% is actually like a compounding um, with the phase two. So having phase 0 0.5 plus phase two um, was that 2026 projection. Again, last thing that, that's well, an observation I have before I ask you the question is, it's amazing the difference in annual costs in these communities. Out here, for what it's worth, Rice Lake at $163 a year, I guess it's 1,000 gallons of water that we can uh, up to 965 down in Roberts. I mean, the cost changes, it's dramatic. But um, I guess a question I wanted to ask you, though, and again, for the benefit of anybody listening, start talking about just give or take 30 million bucks, kind of all told. That's not, um, obviously, that's shared between the members. And I think I, I read kind of earlier on, in Richmond's share of that is roughly what percent? We're at just under 20 currently, so I think it's like 19.8 million. So that would be that would be dependent on who stays in and who stay, who gets Ab out. Absolutely, but currently, currently, a fifth yep. of the we 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 provide a fifth of the material. I think that's really kind of how it right. It's gallons or however they measure the stuff. That's what determines what your share of the costs are. So I think Pete said it. You said it. Um, it's. It's a it's a huge investment, and I, I think it's fair to say, and I, I was only at the one meeting, Pete, I know you're kind of dialed into this more than I am, but uh, there's no easy answers here. On the near horizon, right? It's not like a long ways away. I appreciate the information. And I appreciate the staff looking at trying to get cars looking at other options. It's awesome. That's been part of our CIP for the last how many years? It's been in there the last couple of years when Any other questions? 
the, just information right now. Yep, and then we'll bring back this feedback to the meeting this week. Well, maybe if we start televising what's going on in the meeting room and showing the public, maybe that would reduce the quantity of what we're dealing with out there. Yeah, we'll sell, there it is. Tom's got it. We'll sell subscriptions. And actually what we do is when you televise it, we'll say this is this block. That's what we've got on there tonight, folks. So you know, oh, sorry. Ahead of my time. Yeah, cable. There should be a place. I'd increase this thing. That's mine. <laughs> okay. Uh, resolution 022301, 2023 budget amendment for compensation adjustments. Again, Mayor and Council, um, in the packet outlines uh, budget adjustments or a budget amendment. So in the 2023 budget included um, compensation adjustments, which were contained underneath the compensation policy that was adopted in August of 2022. Uh, these funds were budgeted underneath general government at the time that we adopted the budget. And so with the completion of the compensation adjustments, the funds need to be allocated to the correct budget classification and expense category so that over um, the remainder of the year, we don't have to report on a budget variance um, to the council quarterly during our financial reporting. So in your packet um, is the resolution that would amend the 23 budget to allocate the funds to the appropriate categorization. So you'll see the reduction coming out of general funds or general government and then going into those more broad um, categorizations of the budget. The amendment uh, will result in a small budget reduction of $470. So we had um, a little bit under what we had budgeted actually being um, allocated and adjusted this year. So staff recommend approval of resolution 022301, which is the 2023 budget amendment. Your motion to approve. I'm sorry. No, you can go ahead if you want to. I was just going to ask some questions. Oh, yeah, let's get there. Um, well, I'll make a motion that we approve resolution 022301. Second. Any discussion? Yes. Questions? <laughs> so I read through the memo, and I just have a couple of questions about just how other things shook out, I guess we'll say. So in terms, number one, what is conservation and development? What is? So in that category, so these bucket, the classification categories are what we have to report on our state report. Mm -hmm. So underneath conservation and development, that's gonna be anything um, with economic development, okay. planning. Okay, I just didn't know if I was missing like a, a department or something, it seemed very strange. So when you look at, you listed out the number of exempt employees and the number of non-exempt employees that received adjustments. Um, can you tell us, was there a significant difference between when an exempt level employee was adjusted versus a non-exempt employee was adjusted? Like, do you have an average of what the compensation adjustment was for exempt employees versus non-exempt employees? I think that's a little bit difficult to give you as an average because it's based upon the pay scale that that individual is classified underneath. So the the criterion which is evaluated per the policy, the compensation policy was based upon their years of tenure experience. And then moving up, up on that lower to the midpoint. So it's difficult to give you an average as to what that is because it's based upon various pay scales for those different job classifications. But each one, I mean, I'm just saying each employee within the exempt employee category, so you don't think that those employees that they, that they can be compared or that you could say, you know, on average, the exempt level <laughs> employees that received a compensation adjustment received like 4% versus you know, the non-exempt employees that received a compensation adjustment because of their location in the midpoint was you know, 6% or something like that. Like That's what I'm asking. Oh. Can I re-ask the question? Um, Have you is, can say it better. Well, I'm <laughs> yeah. just comparing the exempt and non-exempt. Is there, in your opinion, I, at this point, unless you have the numbers, was there a material difference 
in the percentage of increase that exempt <laughs> employees saw that got an adjustment versus the non-exempt? Is there a material difference or in based kind of um, off the top of your head, right? Because you don't have that math in front of you. But just as you work through this, did, was there a material difference between the percent of increase that exempt got versus non-exempt? Or would you say they were in the same neighborhood? And I'm not trying to lead you. I'm just curious because it seems to me that's kind of what you're asking. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have kind the of. numbers in front of me, so I don't want to misspeak to that. But it, And I didn't look at it from that lens, to be honest. Sure. Um, when we looked at applying the policy on these adjustments, um, I don't recall anything standing out of significance between various classifications. Um, again, we're looking at it from the length of tenure and how someone is moving and progressing through that um, lower end of the scale to the midpoint. So if, if there was an individual that had a greater differential that needed to be moved through two or three categories of that lower scale, um, obviously that had a bigger impact on that. So to, to kind of apply that by average, it was really on an individual basis um, in order to bring them into compliance with the compensation policy and their performance. Um, not really, but that's, that's fine. Um, I, I mean, there's a specific reason I'm asking, but I don't think it's necessarily appropriate <laughs> this forum. Um, the only other question I had was that they, the goal, obviously, of the compensation policy was to move uh, was to move people towards the midpoint. And there's still nine employees. No. Yeah, 18 employees, sorry, from nine departments that remain below the midpoint for the pay range for their positions. Were there increases given that exceeded the midpoint and individuals that still were below the midpoint? So anyone who um, fell underneath this only moved to the midpoint and not okay. above the midpoint. Okay. And, that, and that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the 3.1% increase, like the cost of employment cost index. Um, it would be adjustments that were made based on the compensation classification. So individuals did not receive increases above the midpoint when we still have a fair number of employees that are below the midpoint. Well, and to preface, the employees that are below the midpoint would not have been moved to the midpoint in this cycle because they haven't met certain criteria in association with the compensation policy. So that's just to give the council an idea that we still have 18 employees from those nine departments yep. that are still progressing through that kind of corridor of the pay scale before they get to the midpoint and then go to that hybrid evaluation. Okay. So a lot of those 18, some of them may have just been hired in the last year. Okay. So you know, they may be at 15% of the range right now. Next year, they may move up. Again, you know, assuming they have a, um, they're meeting expectations with their performance review. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I think like Rayan was saying with, um, basically our focus at this point was getting staff to the midpoint. We haven't started. Now for, I would say for next year's budget, we would then have that performance base component so staff that are currently at the midpoint or above, um, uh, and that also impacts our timeline for um, performance review. So although we yeah. traditionally we've done these at the end of the year, we will now be doing this again in June. Okay. <laughs> so that for budgeting purposes, the council already knows, and it's up to your discretion then about how much money is going to be made available. Um, for the, so anyone that was already at the midpoint or above, um, if they had either met or exceeded expectations, received the 3.1%. Um, now, like Rain indicated, this first year, in some ways you're catching some staff up. Yep. You may have someone who, they've been in their current position for eight years and they're still not at the midpoint. They may be going up to the midpoint where you have a new hire who has been here a year and a half. They're not going up to the midpoint right away. Um, they're gonna, but both are still following the, the policy. I would expect that this this first year with 
um, compensation adjustments is likely going to be larger than what you're going to see as that the 18 employees basically move through and obviously we hope they continue to stay here and we they know that okay if I'm doing a good job I know that by you know four years of employment I'm going to be at that 50 percent where in years past um, once you were hired you just stayed at that amount unless we came to the council and said this person and this person so we hope this has a little more um, consistency um, yes. but the the numbers I would say between exempt and non-exempt again depending on the range for that respective position and in some cases if an employee had been in their position for a long time and was under that 50 percent they're going to have a larger increase in this first year or at least they're at that midpoint now typically how long does it take them to get to the midpoint i mean they get up there how long is that typically well so before the compensation policy was adopted we didn't have a timeline we didn't have a step system so really this was kind of a hybrid where essentially you have a step system up to the midpoint and then once you're at the midpoint for your position then it's really that performance based component um, so we have had some staff that have been below the midpoint who have been in their position for a long time um, but were never moved up um, and then you have some new hires who wonder okay what do I have to do to get a raise and there really wasn't a process to say you're you know you're going to move move up more in a in a step manner so um, so under the policy we'd be looking at four years from someone now obviously it also depends on their previous experience you may have someone who um, you know depending on the position they might come with 20 years experience they're not going to start at the very bottom of the, the pay range so you may have some who although they haven't been here very long they may start up a little higher up in their scale based on their qualifications and in some cases even the difficulty of filling a position where you may have to be more competitive in some cases to you can't just say let's offer the very bottom and hope that they accept it you know um, any other questions uh, you want to take the roll please Alderman Weinmeyer yes Alderman Montello yes Alderman Volker yes. Alderperson Kraft yes Alderman Kittle? Yes. Alderman Freeze? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, library building project, next steps. Yeah, I just wanted to provide a, a brief update on the library building project. Um, no action is required here this evening. Um, the soil borings uh, for the project were completed in January. Um, so we have the geotechnical uh, report um, that was completed. Uh, this was by a firm out of uh, Chippewa Falls area. So if uh, if you saw some equipment on the site or some snow getting moved um, or if community members were by and if you saw stakes marked out there that's where they were doing all of the, the various borings and um, in some cases they went down about 30 feet underground obviously we want to make sure that if there's a, a concern with the soil conditions um, that we identify that um, now uh, rather than further down the road uh, so that uh, that component of the, the project has been completed um, we've been working with uh, ISG on the preliminary floor plan and the renderings for the project. Um, we do have an updated um, exterior rendering for the building, uh, which we showed it to the library board um, at their last meeting, as well as an interior rendering. And um, again, we're, we're not at a point where we're picking out colors and details, but it, it gives community members something to um, really to be able to visualize and, and give feedback on. Um, you know, especially you looking at a floor plan for some people you know they're not used to doing that but you can actually show them a picture to say this is what the building would look like if you were driving on Arch Avenue um, so we hope to uh, um, put some of these uh, these updated renderings out um, on display for the community to see and uh, as part of that also doing some additional uh, community engagement so uh, whether that be small meetings whether that um, we've talked about going to uh, we have parent teacher conferences again this Thursday and next week Thursday and I'm um, trying to go out there and um, meet people meet people where they're at not expecting that they're all going to come to a meeting here but to say if, if we know that there's gonna be a lot of um, parents of young kids at the schools this Thursday afternoon let's go out there and um, we may see more parents there in a couple of hours than what will come to a, you know a town hall meeting give feedback on the design um, really our our next step right now is really to get 
um, a good cost estimate for the project. And so um, between now and our February uh, work session, um, I'm gonna be reaching out to a few different um, experienced contractors uh, to see if they would be able to assist us in that process. And um, you know, a lot of this is really trying to bridge the gap between what an architect may do versus the actual constructability of, of the project. And um, oftentimes what you see in public construction is that you know, we, we can't have a design build process. And so an architect comes up with a plan you, and you put it out there for bid, and then typically you get a bunch of change orders <laughs> because the contractor says, well, that doesn't make sense, that doesn't make, make sense, they missed something here. Um, you know, we'll do this because that's what the plans say, but I wouldn't have done it that way. I would have done the HVAC differently. And so right now, in terms of getting price estimates for the council to really make an informed decision on, it isn't just to get feedback from the architect, because they may just give you some very general numbers on a <coughs> per square foot basis. They may say, well, we, we worked on a library in this other community or a school or an office building, and it was about this much, so therefore your project will be about that much. You know, every project is very unique in terms of, you know, whether it be the, the plumbing, the electrical, the HVAC, Really, we want to have feedback from folks who um, have current pricing to say, um, you know, if you change this, you'd save 10% on your project cost. Um, where right now, obviously, with construction costs, we're seeing a wide spectrum of, of costs. Um, lumber prices have gone down. Concrete costs have gone up quite a bit just in the last month. And um, Ultimately, we want the council to make an informed decision. We don't want to say, well, we think it's going to be about this, but we're not really sure. We also don't want to give you a huge range to say, well, you know, it, it's like when you watch the weather sometimes. Might get an inch of snow, and might get 12 inches. Well, <laughs> that doesn't help you on a construction project like this. And we don't want sticker shock if you go through final design, getting state approved building plans, bidding it out, and then you say, ooh, ouch. Um, let's go back and try to fix that. Basically, we're saying let's try to fix that now. <laughs> um, so like we talked about with the, the biosolids project, we bid it out, hey, it came in $2 million over budget, let's talk to the engineer and see what can we do to, well, rather than going through all those steps, why not do that right at the very get-go? <laughs> to say, does this make sense? Are there opportunities that we can um, reduce costs? And um, really to try to give the council the most informed, accurate numbers that we can get. Um, as we've seen in other projects in the past that we bid out, it, even if it be for a simple park shelter, <laughs> the low bid is 45,000, the high bid is 100,000. And you think, did you look at the same plans? <laughs> what, is the, what is the difference? We can't have that on a building project of this size to have this huge range. We really want to feel confident and for the council to say, are we, do we want to proceed or do we have to make changes and scale the project back? So. Um, uh, so that's really our, our next step, and um, really trying to get some hard numbers, talking to the contractors and subcontractors. Again, not at a point of actually bidding the work out yet. We're not at that point of having final design, but um, you know, we don't want to say, well, is it is it five million dollars? Is it ten million dollars? Um, you know, we really want to hone it in to say, okay, we we feel really good. We think it's about in this amount. And um, are there some things from a value engineering standpoint that um, we could do differently to help bring the cost down? Um, especially when it comes to uh, some of the interior finishes or furnishings. Um, you know, there's a wide range in terms of furniture costs. Is the library gonna be carpeting? Is it tile? Is it hardwood floor? Um, are those, um, you know, how many staff offices do we have versus a flexible space or a cubicle situation? You know, are there really, at the end of the day, what are the, the priorities and the must-haves and the true needs versus maybe some of the wants to say that'd, that'd be really great and the architect might say that looks really pretty, but we don't need it. <laughs> and um, so that'll be really our next step here. Um, we feel that the, the floor plan, the design are getting close um, and that's really the fun part, but really now it's to say, what are the hard numbers? And we want to be able to go out to the community to say, here's what we think the project's going to cost. Here's what the impact would be on an average homeowner. Here's what the financing would, would look like um, to make that happen. And uh, um, right now, um, you know, if you were to ask, well, what's the project going to cost? We'd say, well, we don't know. 
well, we do need to know. We need to have uh, an accurate number. So, uh, so between now and the uh, February work session, um, be engaging with a few contractors to say, is this something you think you'd be able to help? Give us some feedback on work with the city, with um, ISG, to look at some of these plans and um, really from the, the, the eyes of a general contractor as compared to the architect. Um, so again, uh, no, no uh, action needed tonight, just wanted to inform the council on, on next steps. Uh, the renderings themselves we'll have on display at the library. We, we want to move them around. Um, so probably have them at the library. Like I said, we'll, in some cases we'll be taking them out to some other community events. We may have them on display here at the Civic Center on um, Election Day um, in February. And um, we've also talked about making a short uh, video that we can put on um, the city website, the library website, on Facebook um, for people to, to watch. So um, if anyone has any, uh, any questions, uh, feel free to just let me know. But again, no, no action needed tonight. Not uh, any communication or miscellaneous. No. Always. <laughs> Early voting is open for the February 21st primary. For those who've taken a look at the sample ballot, it's a very small ballot, but a super important primary. So please feel free to come on down and vote. Otherwise, polls will be open on the 21st from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. And we'll be utilizing the north entrance. Um, also, on May 22nd and 23rd, I know this is far out, but Nora Allen at the library has pulled together a really, really cool program. The Richard Bong Veterans Memorial in Superior is coming down to New Richmond, and for two days they're going to be um, getting oral histories of veterans in our area. So if you have questions, if you know people, please talk with Nora. Um, and get them signed up because they do need to do a pre-interview for that. And lastly, just a congratulations to staff. We had an internal competition to collect rolls of toilet paper for Grace Place Shelter over the last couple of weeks, and almost 600 rolls were collected, and we're delivering them as a Valentine's Day gift. Some get candy, some get other things. <laughs> it seemed like it went with the theme for tonight, though, so I think it was a good one. Part of the mile solids uh, discussion, right? <laughs> we don't need to include that one in our. Okay, anything else? I just relative to your question about the north entrance or your comment about the north entrance, do we? With the doors and windows. Yeah. Uh, so Indian Head Glass is the contractor for the project. Uh, they said uh, at least 12 weeks out for, for materials. Still? A couple months away. Yeah. Still 12 weeks out? Yeah, so we're still out for. <laughs> wow. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to mention too, um, obviously we've had some warmer weather here. It looks like it's gonna be a bad year for potholes uh, here this spring. So if folks um, encourage them to use the Keep It Beautiful form, let us know both for um, you know road conditions, but also if we have um, water pooling by some of the drains, let us know. We will have staff going out and um, trying to keep up with that. but. <laughs> Raise my hand now. <laughs> Love the gravel, by the way. Okay, uh, anything else? Otherwise, uh, I, I think, Mr. Mayor, we should, uh, I'd like to thank the staff for our new rating for Moody. Really responsible council, our, our uh, Drives down borrowing costs. So that's the, the that it drives down borrowing costs. Yes. Yes. To borrow cheaper. Yep. So great job, Rand, and your team. Motion go in closed session per state statute nineteen point eight five one G. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Want to take the roll, please? Alderman Montello? Yes. Alderman Volker? Yes. Alderperson Kraft? Yes. Alderman Kittle? Yes. Alderman Vries? Yes. Alderman Weinmeyer? Yes. We're in closed session. Anybody need a little break? This conference is no longer being recorded. Everybody take a break if you want. <laughs>